You can do it. These four powerful words, instilled in Mary Kay Ash as a child, fueled an unshakable confidence and belief in limitless possibilities. This belief carried her through childhood challenges, propelling her from a young girl of humble means with responsibilities far beyond her years to a sales phenom. But for Mary Kay, true success meant creating a full life. As a single mom and driven businesswoman, she believed women could have it all. And she taught her children that with enthusiasm and hard work, anything is possible. She would prove it. After years of being dismissed by male colleagues for thinking like a woman, Mary Kay doubled down on that strength. She not only shattered the glass ceiling, she built a ladder determined to help others reach their highest potential. She created a company for women to feel confident, beautiful, and connected with the support of her family and a dedicated girl tribe. This game-changing business sealed Mary Kay's status as an icon. And through her timeless legacy, Mary Kay continues to empower women to dream big and ignite success. Women fueled by four words. You can do it. If Then, an initiative from Lida Hill Philanthropies aims to empower STEM innovators as role models and inspire the next generation of girls to pursue STEM careers. The If Then collection is the largest database of images available depicting real women in STEM, featuring photos, videos, posters, bios, and more from amazing women innovators with unique STEM careers. These items are free for non-commercial and non-profit use. The collection is a core component of the If Then mission to change the way the world sees women in STEM. We can't wait to see how your organization might use these images to inspire the next generation. Your ideas are valuable. Don't limit yourself to professions that you think sort of exist in a box. You can be really creative. How do I get to a certain place and do I need to always take a traditional route? There are no rules. Own your career, own your journey. You should really embrace how unique you are as a person. And eventually you'll succeed. If we never say no to any dream, then the world is your oyster. Interested in using the If Then Collection in your school or nonprofit organization? Visit the ifthencollection.org to learn more. Hello. Well, welcome to our session. Um, we are so thrilled to have everybody here today. And we're really excited to share with you uh, more about the event initiative. And most importantly, for you all to hear from two of our most amazing ambassadors. So um, I'm going to kick off the session just to tell you how it's going to go, tell you a little bit more about the event initiative. You just saw a little bit about the collection. And then we're going to jump in with our panelists. Um, they're going to both tell you a little bit about their backgrounds, about their experience with FN, and all the amazing work that they're doing. Um, I've got a couple of questions, and then we're going to take some questions from the audience as well at the end. So hopefully um, you guys will walk away even more inspired. Um, I know every time I uh, talk with these women, I get really excited. So I hope that everyone who's live streaming with us today will feel the same way. Um, I'm Nicole Small with Light Hill Philanthropies and LH Capital, and what we are here today representing the If Then Initiative. Um, for those of you who might have seen us talk about it a little bit this morning, forgive me, I am going to just give you a quick overview so to set the stage for these amazing women. Um, the If Then Initiative is something that was started out of Lida Hill Philanthropies um, based on Lida's passion about inspiring the next generation of uh, young girls to pursue careers in STEM. As many of you know, um, women in STEM tend to still be a smaller percentage of the workforce. And there's a real opportunity. You know, we don't have to explain to anybody right now. Anyone that turns on the news knows you might be worried about climate change, you might be worried about COVID, and you might have normal things, normal things like cancer that you're worried about as well. So um, we know that if we want to change the world, we need 
everybody sitting at the table. So we need all of the best thinkers, um, no matter how old you are, no matter what you look like, no matter where you live, we need to make sure we are pulling as many people to put them at the table to think about solutions to solve the world's greatest problems. And at Light Hill Philanthropies, we fundamentally believe, fundamentally believe that science is the answer. And we know that with COVID, science is definitely going to be the answer. And so to do that, we've got to actually change the narrative around women in science. And so there are amazing groups like Girls Who Code and lots of people doing great work in the space. And we found that we really believe that one of the holes in the market was actually imagery and the way girls see themselves. And we know that if you can see it, you can be it. And alternatively, if you don't see someone that looks like you doing something that you're passionate about, you might not think that there's a pathway for you to pursue that career. And we really wanted to change the imagery and the storytelling around women in STEM. And that's why it then was launched. So it then has a variety of components. Uh, the first is that we continue to fund women doing actual science. There are amazing women scientists doing amazing work everywhere and we're continuing to lift them up by funding their projects. We also wanted to pull together a coalition of um, members who are passionate about um, telling stories about science. And so those might be expected groups like National Geographic, Conservation International. And we also wanted to pull the unexpected groups like U.S. Women's Soccer, Project Runway, to really tell the story that STEM is everywhere. Um, we obviously have a world-class U.S. women's soccer team as an example, and they will tell you that if it worked for their physical therapists and their orthopedic surgeons and their nutritionists, they could not play at the level that they play at. And it's really important for us to tell those stories that there's a team behind that team. So that's a big part of this work as well. And the last is working with our partners to actually tell those stories. So we launched Mission Unstoppable last year, um, which is our Saturday morning TV show. You can also find it digital. Um, that actually was up for two Emmys this year, which was really exciting in our first season. We've got a series on YouTube with Goldie Blocks and a variety of other projects. We're working with museums across the country uh, to share the collection that you just learned about. And this morning we were proud to announce, um, Lida announced that she, in partnership with the Texas Women's Foundation, has invested a half a million dollars for our local partners in North Texas to be able to use the collection. So not only is it great to have the largest free collection of digital assets of women in STEM anywhere in the world available, we also know that sometimes it takes capital to actually use those images to create the virtual sessions that teachers need to print pictures for walls of museums and zoos. So we are really thrilled to announce this morning that we're opening um, an RFP process with the Texas Women's Foundation to actually use the collection you just learned about. So um, lots and lots of exciting things going on with If Then. And um, I think the most recent exciting thing we're gonna tell you about, and we're gonna jump into our panelists, is our statue exhibition. Um, sadly, we were about to launch the world's largest collection of women's statues anywhere in the world in May of this year. Um, but COVID got in the way. So we have had an exciting opportunity. We've um, launched it in two pop-ups this year, but I want to tell you a little bit more about the statue exhibit uh, with this video. So if we can cue the video, that would be great. There are thousands of statues of historical figures displayed across the United States. But think for a moment. Can you remember the last time you came across a statue honoring a woman? For example, Manhattan Central Park currently has 23 statues honoring male historical figures like William Shakespeare and Christopher Columbus, but not a single statue honoring a real woman until in 2020 when a monument was finally unveiled to honor suffrage pioneers Sojourner Truth, Susan B. Anthony, and Elizabeth Cady Stanton. A study of 12 major U.S. cities found less than six statues of real women total on public display in parks and downtown areas. Yes, less than six. Well, that number is about to skyrocket when this exhibit debuts in Dallas, Texas in 2021. This monumental exhibit will feature the most statues of women ever assembled in one location at one time. Over 120 statues of real female STEM professionals from a wide variety of industries will be displayed in Dallas's North Park Center. This free exhibit is presented by Lida Hill Philanthropies' If Then Initiative. If Then aims to empower current female STEM innovators as role models and inspire the next generation of girls to pursue STEM careers. Each life-size statue honors an If Then ambassador and was created using state-of-the-art 3D printing technology. We're going to be 3D full body scanning you in the scanner to our left and the final product will be a full-sized 
imprint of you. Three, two, one. There it is. That's good. Nice. This is gorgeous. These pictures are combined to create a 3D model, which is 3D printed layer by layer. Once the statues are printed and fully hardened with UV light, they are refined. After that, the final step is painting. So we have one of the final prints that's already been painted, all dried and cured and ready for display. When the process is finished, over 120 statues of real female STEM innovators will have their stories shared in this first-of-its-kind exhibit. And be sure to check out the limited previews of the exhibit leading up to the full launch, like a pop-up of six wildlife conservation scientists featured in New York's Central Park Zoo, or another pop-up of 10 diverse STEM role models at North Park Center in Dallas. If Then is making history and truly inspiring the next generation of girls to realize their potential. Because if she can see it, then she can be it. It's so exciting. I might have recognized one of those statues on the screen here. So um, for those of you who are watching from North Texas, just a reminder, the pop-up is in North Park and it's um, going through November 9th. So if you haven't been able to see it, um, wear your mask, social distance, and you can go and see the exhibition. Or if you happen to be in New York or watching from New York, please join us in Central Park and see our six amazing women. So let's turn to our amazing women innovators. These women are going to introduce themselves to you. They're going to tell you about their stories. And uh, they join a cast of 125 amazing women. You can learn more about on ifthenshecan.org. But let's start with Dr. Rhonda Ham. Rhonda, can you introduce yourself and tell us your story and tell us more about why you're excited to be part of this initiative? Yeah, so thank you, Nicole. Um, and thank you, everyone, for joining us today. If you happen to visit the uh, North Park exhibit, um, and you see uh, the statue with a insect net. That is actually me. So I am an entomologist, which essentially means I am a scientist that studies insects. Um, I'm also the uh, global academic relations leader at Corteva AgriScience. So I feel like I have the best job in the world because I get to truly marry my science with the education, the outreach passion that I have um, to bring the science to the community. And so um, in my role, I sort of tease that I do K through gray education and outreach, which essentially means I do education with all ages, um, but including youth. And I think that's uh, where we have a, a huge opportunity. Um, and I have worked with my Corteva colleagues to create what we call our Corteva Grows Science Outreach Program to ensure that industry professionals are accessible and can talk about the sciences that we do and why it matters to the community and how we're a part of our communities um, wherever we happen to live and, and work um, around the world. And so our program started as a very local initiative um, with some passionate employees, um, much like if then, you know, we were all passionate individuals and passionate about what we were doing and, and the impacts we could make. Um, but then sharing that with others and bringing them along with us to create this sort of coalition. So, um, and we, you know, as a group, participate in science fairs and are invited into classrooms. Uh, typically, we will go to science nights in the community or um, maybe local festivals will take a science activity to things like the Latino Expo and the Chinese Festival. Um, and really, you know, it's that engagement that um, puts us on the map. It makes women and um, careers that students would never hear about otherwise, like entomology, uh, a bit more accessible. Right? And so um, I am a product of that. I wouldn't be here as an entomologist um, if someone hadn't taken the time when I was in high school to really show me what the world of these most abundant animals on the planet really do for us. What is the impact of insects and how do they impact our lives? And there are so many different ways that we just, we don't even, we take these creatures for granted, really. They pollinate our food. So our food supply would be very limited without having access to insects to help us with that pollination. Um, you know, they are um, responsible for um, transmitting diseases. So if you're interested in public health, that's a great way to um, get involved with 
helping people. Um, so there's just so many different ways that um, I had no idea when I was a student that all these things were possible. And so that's why um, to me, if then is such an important part of my life now. And really the entire experience of being from, from the moment I was selected as a if then ambassador to the time that I met the other ambassadors um, to now being a statue has been a completely surreal experience. And I, I've, I've told this story to friends and family that I don't think I've ever been a part of a group where I felt accepted so quickly. Like I hadn't even met a lot of these women and we had been announced so we could see each other's names and we immediately started following each other on social media. And we were fans of each other long before we ever met in person. We walked in and I was like, you're Kristen, you're Crystal, you're, you know, and, and it, the, the list went on and on and on. And so um, I, I've never had that before, that instantaneous, this is a part of a group that I belong in. This is, this is the feeling we wanna create for those young girls that maybe don't feel like there's a place for them. There is a place for you. And we want to be that group of women that, that basically opens up our arms like a big hug and brings you into the STEM field. Um, and so we've sort of dubbed ourselves um, the Sisters of STEM, and we truly feel that way, I believe. Uh, another part of what I'd like to focus on is, you know, a lot of equity and accessibility. And that's a huge important part of what all of this is accomplishing with reaching students where they are and in a very diverse way so that we can, um, everything from you happen to be strolling through the mall and you see this exhibit, or you know, you're know you on YouTube looking for some videos to entertain your kids right now through COVID. Um, all of those have now featured women in STEM. And so I um, one of the opportunities that came to me was working with Goldie Blocks on a video in no way in my life would I have thought I have, would have a YouTube video that would have been viewed over 53,000 times. Like that just would have never even crossed my mind as something that I could do or be involved in. And so I'm super proud of that video. It's super fun. If you want to see a little bit more about how I went from being a scared girl, I, I was terrified of insects to studying them, uh, check it out. And um then finally, the uh, another tool in the toolbox that Nicole mentioned was, um, you know, bringing these visible role models into museums, classrooms, nonprofits, and there's so many creative ways um, that really you're only limited by your own imagination on how these materials can be used. Um, I know that there's discussions of trading cards and books being created with a lot of these materials. So I can't wait to see all the different things that come out of, of that collection. Um, and then finally, um, the opportunity that I had, I was lucky enough that the statues that you saw on the video uh, were printed in Indiana, which is where I happen to live. Um, so I made a drive up to see uh, and meet the amazing staff at Group Delphi that really made these come to life and were responsible for the printing and, and really all steps of the process from the 3D um, scans to the printing. And uh, I got to geek out a little bit. Um, as a scientist, uh, 3D printing is not my area of expertise, uh, but I had the chance to walk through and see every step from online adjusting where the supports should go while these things are printing so that they harden in the right position and um, you know are sturdy to uh, the final touches of how the artistic piece comes into play to making sure that our facial features are right and our clothes are right and our item that we were asked to bring um, is realistic. And so um, all of that, I literally totally geeked out while I was there, I'm not gonna lie, because um, it was a totally new process for me. I don't know much about 3D printing, but now I know a little. And um, then I got to see my own statue and that is something that is super hard to explain. Um, I went from shock of, I'm standing here next to a statue, a life-size statue of myself, to feeling so honored and deeply touched, to, you know, we all know is imposter syndrome of denial of, why on earth did they choose me? I'm just a girl that studies insects that, um, really, you know, why me? Um, so that imposter syndrome, kind of creep in there for me. Um, and those were 
the initial reactions. But then as I stood there a little bit and I really looked around me at all the other amazing women that I realized something, that there's really three things that came into play. One was that these statues don't just represent myself. They represent the women that have struggled for years to be seen, heard, valued in their careers and helped blaze a trail for me to make it a little easier for me. They also represent the amazing, talented 122 women that they are, right? That's the second thing. And the third thing is they show the, the path for those coming behind us, that they too have a place, that there's a next generation of girls in STEM and that they're not alone on that path, that there are others. Um, and so I think that, you know, these successful women in all these fields, we all started as young girls with dreams. And I really can't express it better than the if then tagline of if she can see it, she can be it. And these statues really do allow women to, and their parents, um, to see it and believe that their students can be it. Well, thank you for sharing all that. I mean, I clearly don't need to say anything else about how amazing you all are. Um, you know, we actually shared with the broader group on a town hall last week a story that we heard from the head of the Central Park Zoo that happened to be walking by a little girl and her mother um, who were admiring the statues at the Central Park Zoo last week. And he sent us an account of this conversation. And the short part of the account was that the little girl looked at her mom and said, oh my goodness, they like the things I like. And the mom said, right. Do you remember when those little boys made you feel bad last year in your math class for being excited about math and science? And she said, yeah, but these women like math and science too. And the mom said to the little girl, I hope that makes you feel better. This is what you can do when you grow up. And he said that it was just completely off the cuff and heard the full conversation. And I think for us at Light Health Anthropies, and I know for all of you, that was just the moment. That was everything that this is about, is you all standing in front of those, that little girl, you changed her life forever. And we happen to know that we've had over 100 million impressions on If Then Media already, which means that we've had 100 million you know, people and little girls everywhere already exposed to the work you all are doing. And, you know, we cannot, we will never be able to count the lives that are changed because of, you know, all of the work you're doing. So I'm going to turn to Dr. Emery. We'd love to hear your story as well. So please tell us more about you and the amazing work that you're doing, please. Uh, thank you. And, uh, thank you, Rhonda, uh, for, you know, capitalizing um, all of the amazement and the energy um, and the sisterhood. So I'm Crystal Emery, and I'm the founder of and the CEO of You Are You the Right to Be. And I am a production company, and I exist at the intersection of the humanities, art, science, and technology. Uh, I also am a member of the Producers Guild, uh, which I work really hard. And um, I'm also a member of New York Women in Film and Television. Among other things, I am a virtual reality um, uh, producer. And currently, I'm working on two projects Building Bridges, The Power of the Sisterhood, and Our Humanity. Um, you know, everything in our society is media, right? Everything. I mean, from you know what you choose to eat, what you choose to wear, what your belief system is, it's all affected by me. And what I do is work to change that narrative, right? And so when you think about Change the Face of STEM, which is a project that is a national initiative of ours, um, what does that mean to change the face of STEM? Well, number one, let's talk about the different types of jobs. People always think when you hear STEM, it's science or technology or engineering or math, but they never realize that filmmakers are part of that technology, right? Like what we are doing right here, right now is what I do. I, this year I produced 
and these five programs at Stegar. Uh, one of those programs had over 3,000 uh, people that chimed in on it. So changing the narrative is really, really important because, you know, we always talk about history, right? Well, I want to talk about her story, right? Because we have to change the images that not only other people see, but the images that we digest about ourselves. I think that for me, uh, one of the amazing things about being a triple AS if that ambassador was actually coming together in Dallas. So I tell this story because I am not a believer of coincidences, right? I believe that you are where you are because you're supposed to be there. So 2019 was a really hard year for me. My lungs collapsed, I was sick. We did this huge project at the National Academy of Science. And I just thought, okay, this is it for me. I'm gonna go home and just take a break. And then Matt uh, by the Hill called me, or sent me an email, and he said, you know, you need to apply for the if that initiative. And I was like, oh, well, you know, man, I, I'm barely like, you know, breathing here. And he said, I really think you should apply for it. And I did. At the same time, my company, You Are You The Right To Be, changing the face of STEM, we were um, doing a big workshop. Um, and I forget what the date was. October 24th, October 24th, 25th, and 26th. And where was the workshop? Dallas, Texas. So I'm thinking, you know, I can't get there. Um, I don't want to get there. I'm tired. And then I get this letter that says, you have been accepted as one of the IFNET ambassadors. And I go, oh, hell, what? What is this? So I believe that there's a power greater than myself. And I'm like, okay, okay. I know Universal Mind wants me to go to Texas. How am I going to get to Texas? What I didn't know was, or pay attention to, that the If Then event was three days before changing the face of staff. So now I go, all right, all of my guardian angels, all of my ancestral women are working extra hard. And then if that says, oh yeah, by the way, we pay for your accommodations and it get you there. Now I got in a van, it took two and a half days to drive to Dallas, Texas. I have to tell you that the first day of meeting these, well, let me go back to the opening reception. It's really hard being in a wheelchair. Um, and it's hard being in a room with a lot of people. And I was sort of hesitant, you know, like around in a circle or, or sit in a corner. Um, but I came to the W, I think it was at the W. And there was so much love there, right? And one of the projects that I'm doing is called Building Bridges, the Power of the Sisterhood. And it is about getting women in STEM to learn how to be allies. Here we were with this group of women who were really nervous at first, right? Because there were all sorts of levels of degrees and who you were and who you wanted to be. Um, but everyone lowered their defense mechanisms and we celebrated each other. And that is why it is so important that we capture those stories, that we share them on a bigger stage so that everyone, not just younger women, but we need men to understand our capableness. You know, we need those who are still the gatekeepers to say, oh, I didn't know that a woman did that. 
but oh, I didn't know that a woman was capable of that. So we are changing how we see ourselves, how young girls see the possibilities, and how men see us differently. And you know, as much as we like to say women power, and I'm all about women power, we also need to have allies among men. So it was an honor to meet all the women there. Uh, it's an honor to be a AAAS IFNET ambassador. Um, and to let young women everywhere know that, you know, when you see me, you see yourself, you see the possibilities. Um, filmmaking is a very rewarding um, profession because you really get to change or be part of changing people's belief system. And so, you know, I think the IFNET initiative transcends what are the current misbeliefs about women. And we are correcting history. So that's what I do, and I'm so honored to be here with you. Well, thank you. And we're so glad you took that phone call from Matt, I can't tell you, because you've been such an important part of this story, and we, we're, we're glad that you're here too. So thank you. I just, I said, I'm trying not to tear up as you all talk, so. Um, you know, I'm going to start with a couple of questions and then we're getting some from the audience as well. And feel free to keep sending them in. I can see them. Um, we're talking a lot about you all being mentors and role models for your girls. Will you need to talk a little bit about those? Who, who played that role for you when you were growing up? And Rhonda, you talked a little bit about high school changing your, I don't know if it was a favorite bug or a favorite teacher that got you into this career, but you can tell us about both. Um, we talked a little bit about your mentors and who inspired you. Yeah, so actually the the two, um, and actually Crystal led right into this. So my first two mentors were men. Um, they were the two that um, I got this internship in high school. I was this young high school kid, terrified of insects. So I wasn't looking forward to the experience. So I wasn't like, yay, let's go to work. I was more like, great, what do you need me to do? I'm gonna do the minimum and go home. Uh, but they brought me in and I was a colleague immediately. They didn't treat me like the high school kid that was there just to wash dishes. I was there to do a project and it was my project. They led me through, here's the steps, here's what we're thinking. They asked my opinion, which blew me away that this PhD level doctor is asking this high school kid who is terrified of insects and doesn't even know what an entomology lab is. <laughs> what her opinion was. And so for me, that was my um, entrance to say, I can do this and I can be this. And um, that support system that I needed at the time, you know, they literally made me feel like a colleague on the first day and um, that changed everything. And then to get your fun question about my favorite insect. Um, so it, it comes down to two. So I, I have to say ants, I think, kind of tease that ants are my gateway insect um, because they're not very intimidating, right? They're kind of interesting. If you watch a uh, an ant colony for any amount of time, the way that they're able to communicate and work together and they're just interesting structurally. Um, th that was the insect that I worked on in that lab. And so that was my introduction. It wasn't something that I was completely terrified of. It was something that kind of led me into getting over my fear of every other creepy crawly. Um, and so I, I have to give it to ants. I'm going to look at ants completely differently in my backyard now. So maybe I, I will spend a little more time observing them as my gateway and maybe we'll be a little less afraid of spiders around here. So, well, thank you for that. We appreciate that. <laughs> Um, Dr. Emery, can you talk a little bit about who inspired you and who you looked up to in a way that we're hoping, you know, kids look up to you all? You know, my two role models were first with my grandmother. Um, my grandmother was what I called an artist without an art form. But she was also one of the first of five women um, that was ordained within the Church of God. Now, you know, religions tend to be, you know, very oppressive uh, to women. And she was one of the first five women ordained as a minister. 
Uh, I watched her go to all bell meetings. I watched her where other ministers just ignored her existence. And she was always persistent. She wasn't the loudest person in the room, but she was the most determined person in the room. And she eventually earned respect from her male colleagues, not by waving, you know, a big loud back at them, but really by demonstrating the power of being a woman. Um, and so she was just determined and very quiet about it. Um, and when she passed, over 500 people came from around the world. She lived to be 101. And wow. so that's my greatest role. In film, Riyad Murphy is the first filmmaker, uh, cinematography for allowed in the union. And I met her, I was taking a class at UCLA and I was the only woman in the class and she was teaching the class. And she said to me, she said, you know, women never take cinematography classes. They never take behind the scenes in film because they don't think that they're gonna be able to do it. And she said, I am just so happy to have you here. And she just went out of her way to introduce me to animation before animation was big, uh, to introduce me to some other folks that eventually gave me jobs. And again, taking that class that I was the only female. So what does that say? Right, if it's all males creating our, our images, right? It's all males narrating our story. And Brianne Murphy, she just opened her her heart, her mind, her technology, um, and that really affected the filmmaker I am today. Thank you so much for sharing that. It's really just so meaningful to hear who inspired you all because I feel confident that one day there's going to be some kids, little girls who are on something like this. Well, maybe in person, hopefully, talking about you all um, and how you inspired them. So I appreciate that. Um, you know, Rhonda, you obviously do so much outreach. Will you share with us a little bit how COVID's affected some of the work that you guys have been doing and how it's kind of changed? your approach, because obviously getting out into classrooms is challenging right now, and that's part of what you were doing. So tell us how COVID's affect your work. Yeah, so when I was asked to work from home back in March, um, one of my immediate concerns was the youth organizations and the schools that I worked with. And I thought, you know, of the students that we work with, some are homeless. How is this going to impact them? You know, they're used to getting two meals at least at school. Now they won't have that. Um, the education that they usually get, you know, now it's virtual, which is great if you have access to a device or internet access and connectivity. But um, as an agricultural business, we work in a lot of communities that are very rural and may not have reliable internet access. And so a lot of those things went through my mind really quickly of this is going to change the dynamics of education. Um, and so we pivoted very quickly from our in-person to online where we could, but then beyond that, thinking of how can we access those students that don't have that connectivity? That's not a solution for them. So um, I worked with uh, my partners and we printed off activity books that we sent to food banks because those students and their families were now having to rely on food banks for student meals. And so we distributed activity books along with those meals so that there was some sort of education getting into the hands of those students while the schools were you know, frantically trying to get all of their devices out to students, shipping they needed to, but it all happened so quickly that there was a delay between when they could figure out, okay, how many iPads or Chromebooks or whatever do we need? Um, where are those students and how do we get those into their hands? 
um, that there was a gap in, in the time that that occurred. So we tried our best to fulfill at least some educational um, value through that channel. Um, and we got a lot of really great feedback um, from our food bank partners that said, you know, hey, this was great addition to what we could offer our families during this time. Um, and so we um, were lucky enough to be able to have done that in Iowa, Indiana, and Delaware. Um, in Indiana, we actually partnered with one of the schools instead of the food bank um, because they had drive-through meal delivery because they were still providing their meals for their families. So um, it looked a little bit different in Indiana, but uh, it's, it's been a challenge and it continues to be a challenge. So um, if anybody has brilliant ideas on how to reach those students that are um, not able to connect online, I would love to have a conversation and hear those ideas. So. Yeah, I think that's an ongoing challenge across the country. Rural and urban districts continue to struggle with that. And that's obviously, you know, it's probably for another panel, but COVID has definitely opened up and I think shined the light on the economic disparities in a way that, you know, is is pretty striking. Um, Crystal, will you talk for a minute about how COVID's affected your work? Obviously, you're a storyteller and being out and telling those stories is an important part of what you're doing. So how have you pivoted during this time with your work? Well, even though I'm a storyteller, taking the faith of staff is really a in-person, one-to-one with students where we build robots and they meet scientists and, you know, we do virtual reality, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, Rhonda, what we have been doing is creating uh, little hubs. So there are areas where I live where kids either don't have access or they don't have a parent to uh, be with them to get them started to do the, the remote classroom. And so we've been working with churches, large churches that have big buildings and creating little learning hubs where, and it can only be like six students, right? So that they are totally distant, you know, they have this school and provided the Chromebook and they come there um, and then there is two adults that can ensure that they're getting on the internet, that somebody is monitoring. And what ended up happening was, you know, you think, well, that's only six students. Well, if you have eight church locations, right, um, or different companies, uh, one of the companies we're working with a pharmaceutical that has given us their whole floor, right? So there's all this open space. Um, I have turned uh, Change the Face of STEM into a project called Our Humanity. And Our Humanity is about how do we change the messaging because people are confused and they're scared. And there's so much mixed messaging. Nobody knows what to believe. So we've been creating culturally sensitive messaging, uh, but also making sure that it gets to the people that need it most. So by going through food banks, um, this past weekend, I just shot uh, two churches delivering food to people's homes. But in those packages, you know, we are putting literature and literature that looks like the people that are receiving it, because that is part of the problem. With the hubs, you know, again, they're just like six kids, you know, at a time, three or four days a week. You know, we do all the proportion. Um, you know, we have the laser thermometers and, you know, hand, et cetera, et cetera but you still make a difference. And those numbers grow, you know, they grow. So that is how it's changed. It's changed my life totally because being a quadriplegic, I am much more susceptible. Uh, but last week I went out to film and, um, you know, it's making us look at our humanity or our lack of humanity. So. That's how it's changed my life. Well, thank you for that and for you know the ability that you all are having um, 
One of the questions was, how can these best practices for your learning hubs be expanded nationwide so more um, young women are impacted? Do you share this story? Is it online somewhere? Is there a way for people to learn more about, Crystal, what you're doing with these hubs that so that our audience can learn more if they'd like to emulate it? You can write us. <laughs> you, okay. know, you know, Nicole, until you said that, I didn't even think of, oh, we should put this on our website. It's just something that we've been doing and growing um, and finding that it works. So anybody can write me at info at uruglobal.org or just look me up. You'll find me. Great. And if anyone in the audience is looking for Crystal's uh, contact information, with her permission, we're, uh, she just shared it, but we're happy to share that. You can find her website as well. So that's great. We have about two minutes left. Um, quick answer to a question from the audience around the exhibition. The question was, will the exhibit travel throughout the nation? Is there a plan to go to rural underserved areas? So right now, um, we had originally intended for the exhibit to open all in one piece in May. These pop-up exhibitions were a bonus. Um, especially during the time of COVID. Um, we're right now focused on trying to get it open in North Texas and we do, um, we are getting a lot of interest in it. So um, we don't totally know what its future is yet, but my guess is you will see it other places. Um, the other thing is you can access a lot of the information online at if then she can the exhibit.org and you can actually see the statues, you can learn about each of the women. So we do have a virtual experience for people um, who aren't able to actually physically get to where the statues are. And again, we're you know asking people to mask and stay home when possible, um, but we hope that you know we will see a different world coming up and we'll be able to share it more broadly. But right now, the virtual experience online is the way we do that. Um, in our final like 32 seconds, I didn't warn you, but I have a quick lightning round of questions for you all to leave the audience with. Um, we got Rhonda's favorite bug. Crystal, do you have a favorite bug? Do I have a favorite one? Uh -huh, bug. Oh. Uh, <laughs> No. You know what? Add to the tower of love and not to the well of hate. Okay, perfect. Well, you're our storyteller. Do you have a favorite movie? Oh my God, uh, Forrest Gump. Uh, Forrest Gump is my favorite movie. Okay, awesome. Ron, do you have a favorite movie? I feel like I'm forced to say a bug's life. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for turning, you know. The party line, that's great. Um, <laughs> last two quick questions. Um, are you either, what are you guys reading right now? Is anyone reading anything interesting that people might be interested in learning about? And what are you, are you listening to a podcast that people might want to know about? Either of those, I'd love to hear what you guys are listening or reading. I am reading The Only Woman in the Room right now. Okay. It's a novel actually that's uh, set from uh, the start of World War II. Um, literally the only woman that was in the room she was a wife to a powerful person and they suspected she wasn't listening i haven't gotten through very much of it um, but it's entertaining so far thank you crystal do you have a podcast or a book that you're listening to or reading to that you'd like to share uh, i am reading all the scripts that i write and i am listening to the podcast that i do every month and i do ig live on wednesdays at 12 o'clock but i just finished reading three scripts for a Athenian film festival. And there were three scripts about women in STEM. And I got to give my feedback on what I thought was the strongest story. Um, and one of them was about Alexander Bell's wife. Um, one was about the woman that uncovered the uh, polluted water in Flint. Um, oh, wow. Yeah, so. Thank you, that's so interesting. Well, we look forward to seeing when those get made into hopefully feature films or movies or wherever they're going. So well, we are out of time. Um, thank you all both so much for spending the time with our audience today. Um, I always love seeing you. Um, you all inspire us and I know you're inspiring millions and millions of people and little girls everywhere want to grow up and be like you all. So thank you for your time and stay safe and healthy. And thank you to the audience for engaging with us today. We appreciate it. Have a good rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nice to see you. Thank you.